coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Brett Stanchu. I'm the librarian here at the Community Library. Thanks for coming out on this night. Um, before we get started, there's just a couple things. I have some books back here that are, um, they're March. The name of the book is March. They're part of the Vermont Reads book. And the Woodbury, oh, there's Lee holding it up. The Judavine Library in Harvick has teamed up with my library. We're going to do a discussion with the speaker March 12th at the Judavine Library in Harvick, but I'll also put that out on Front Porch Forum. You're welcome to take a copy of the book, whether you come or not, um, but you're certainly welcome to take those. They're free of cost. It comes from the Vermont Humanities Foundation. Um, Woodbury Pie Breakfast is Saturday, March 16th, 8.30 in the morning. Everybody should come. It's going to be the end of winter and the start of spring. So tonight, um, Charlie Cogbell is here. He's from Plainfield, um, and he has under-described himself probably as a historical <laughs> ecologist, but you will likely soon see that. Um, this presentation has been nicely arranged by the Woodbury Conservation Commission, who has been very generous with their time in helping us figure out the speaker series. And Charlie Cogbill has very generously donated his time and expertise <coughs> to be here tonight. Um, so thank you all for coming, and I'll let Charlie get started. Okay. Where is it? Um, yeah, uh, I just say I'm a historical ecologist, um, which just means that I'm interested in what um, is out there uh, in your backyard or in your town or in your state or in your country. And I've been uh, looking at and trying to discover uh, how we tell what's um, been here in the past. Um, and try to figure it out. Also, I'm, I'm, I have a, this academic kind of back, background, so sometimes I like to put numbers on things and in, in, in names, and sometimes it isn't in English, but keep me honest here. Um, uh, I, I'm interested in what you have to think and what you can add to the picture, and actually, as you'll see as I go through here, there's a lot you can do. Uh, to, uh, to figure that out. I'd like to start first with saying, um, let's say we came um, uh, through here in about 1781. I think that's when, when Woodbury um, um, uh, was uh, actually um, set aside by the, the, the Independent Republic of Vermont. Uh, or maybe a, a little bit earlier on in uh, 1773 when uh, the um, uh, colony of New York granted a town that covers this territory. Um, if you um, were uh, a, a visitor at that time, what do you think the dominant tree would have been? Spruce. Okay, uh, we got a spruce, we got a beach, we got... Ma maple? What kind of maple? In Woodbury, red maple. Oh, you're thinking of red maple. Very popular today. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, uh, there's a more fundamental question. How would you figure that out? You can get in the time machine, yeah. But a historical ecologist goes out and figures out a methodology of where we can figure out what's going on in a place way back. And that's before the memories or the oral tradition um, uh, would be around. Um, and You're going to turn the lights on? Yeah, turn the lights a little bit. Yeah. <coughs> okay. You can almost see me, so you can see it. Um, I have... Um, You're over there. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hear me now? Um, uh, there are at least three different um, um, ways that I go about uh, dealing with uh, trying to predict what was in the past. And that's a fairly important question. It isn't that esoteric and historical because it can be used to figure out what's going on in the future. If you know what was in the past and what's there today, um, you can um, draw a straight line and uh, make a prediction of what's going on. But we do that in several line, what I call lines of evidence. Uh, lines of evidence in theory, 
that is uh, uh, what the, the textbooks or the, uh, uh, the, the powers that be um, uh, think uh, might have been here. Uh, this is uh, actually a diorama from the Fisher Museum at Harvard Forest in Petersham, Massachusetts. Uh, and it, it is a representation of the last virgin forest in southern New England that was given to uh, Harvard University in 1936, the Pisgah Tract in Winchester, New Hampshire. Unfortunately, in 1938, it all blew down. Uh, and uh, so-called they lost the last virgin forests in southern New England. Um, uh, that's folklore. It did blow down. But whether it was virgin to begin with and whether we lost it to a natural disturbance like a hurricane is begging the question of whether it was virgin or not. In the, uh, in a, uh, any case, you can see what they had. They figured out what the trees were like. Uh, and I love this, the, the virgin forest, uh, the uncut forest, the untrampled forest. In the uh, diorama has two people. There I am in, in 1720 uh, with, <laughs> with a little ax. Uh, uh, I like to think of this as the original surveyor. There's my helper uh, out there. Uh, always overlooked in this of, of the human aspect of the, of the original pre um, colonial force. But we have a theory of what it, it should be like, and this is a representation of that. We can go in the field. We can go to actual sites, remnants, or places that haven't, that we have a known history, usually a limited uh, human influence. This is a Lord's Hill in Marshfield, uh, Vermont. This is the, a brochure from the Vermont Natural Resources Council um, uh, on the old growth forests of, of Vermont. And you can see the picture of the tree. See that tree right on the, in the brochure? It's the same tree as that, except they reversed it because um, old growth it looks better from the inside looking out rather than the outside looking in. They reversed the negative to make it look better on the, on, on the thing. I don't know, if, is that artistic or scientific? Uh, or just a mistake. <laughs> How could you make a mistake? This is what it looks like, and that's what it doesn't look like. Um, I've been on their case for about 10 years now. I think they should reprint it. Um, uh, but some uh, graphic artist has some better idea. Um, be it as it may, this is a remnant. It's a current forest today. It's part of the Groton State Forest. It's, it's, it's one of the fragile areas. It's on the Fragile Areas Registry in Vermont, which is a list of state lands that have significant uh, geologic, botanical, zoological uh, interest. Uh, it is one of the three uh, northern hardwood forests. Uh, on that fragile areas registry and set aside as a research natural area. So we can go and look at these places and they might tell us something about what the past was like. Or we can go into the archives. This is my bread and butter <coughs> of trying to find historical records uh, about uh, what people um, uh, saw um, uh, in the past and they recorded. This is in the, the Callis Town Hall. Uh, there's a piece of, of vellum, which is a map of Callis since 1790. Um, um, and uh, a very interesting um, a document. Uh, so we have those three lines of evidence. We're going to start to follow those in a little bit in detail, but I'd like to start first with the anecdotal. I mean, you can read the history, right? Um, and um, here's uh, Ira Allen's autobiography. Uh, Ira Allen um, um, was one of the founders of the Onion River Company which he and his brothers owned eight townships along the, uh, the Onion River um, uh, in central Vermont. He also prided himself as being a surveyor. He took a one-day course as an apprentice, literally, and then um, uh, signed up for a publisher in Philadelphia to write a book about surveying, because he'd learned all in that one day. Um, <laughs> He also owned the town of Mansfield, which is now gone because it's half in Stowe and half in Underhill, but it covered Mount Mansfield. Um, and in his autobiography, he wrote about, um, uh, he was from Connecticut, and he was one of the proprietors of the town of Mansfield. Uh, proprietors were owners in common, uh, groups of people, usually about 60 people, that got 
um, a, a whole township, a six mile by six mile township from uh, possibly the, the, the colony, the colony of New York or the colony of New Hampshire, um, or later on the Republic of Vermont. Um, and this is an original um, um, uh, uh, New Hampshire grant um, uh, to Ira Allen, his brothers and, and um, their relatives. Uh, and as he surveyed, he said, a difficulty arose in my mind for my object was to sell out. He was a developer, you know. I, I, I give the, uh, part of this talk at the University of Vermont, I love it, talking about Ira Allen uh, that uh, founded the university. And if possible to get 90 pounds for the survey, so he's, he's being paid as a surveyor. A great proportion of the corners on said lots were spruce or fir timber. This is on the, in the mountains. And if I described them as such, it would show the poorness of the town. In my survey bills, I called spruce and fir gumwood, a name not known to the people of Sharon, Connecticut, who were the proprietors. He was trying to foist over as a developer uh, this town. Uh, there's only one problem with this. This is the actual survey bill that uh, Ira Allen gave to the proprietors of the town. And it's 64% beach, 18% spruce, he said up here he didn't want to say there was any spruce. He lied about lying, and he wrote about it in his autobiography. <laughs> However, despite the social um, commentary, um, you can see that, uh, at least for Mansfield, we have an original survey of the lots that's dividing up the town into 100 acre or 120 acre uh, pieces uh, to be given away to individual people to settle the land or possibly sell it again as, as a developer. But at the corner of each of those lots was where trees were, were uh, marked. And here's 64% beach, 18% spruce. That's Mansfield. Do you think that's representative of Wood, uh, Woodbury? How would you find out? Okay, um, a little more to theory before we get down to the, the, uh, the detail. That was anecdotal. That was just, just one person uh, surveying. Uh, this is E. Lucy Brown. She's the queen of the Eastern Forest. Um, the first female graduate of the University of Cincinnati. She loved the deciduous forest and eventually wrote a book in 1950 about the deciduous forests of Eastern North America um, and really visited them and saw forests for what they were before uh, well, in the 1920s and 30s before major uh, uh, changes in them. And she uh, defined forest zones. She had oak hickory zone and oak pine zone. And then she had a zone uh, that she called the hemlock, white pine, northern hardwoods. And it extended all the way from up in Canada down to, yeah, that's done it again. Um, sorry about my pointer. Um, it's, um, down to um, in Pennsylvania where the oak forests start to pick up. And she said that this was a, a, a vast zone and she had data from four different places in the zone. She went one trip, stopped down in Pennsylvania in two places, stopped in western uh, Adirondacks and stopped at Gifford Woods in Killington. It's currently Killington. It used to be um, Shelburne. Um, Sherburn, excuse me, Sherburn, Vermont. Um, uh, Gifford Woods is a state park. She stopped there in, in 1946 to visit that. Um, and that's the only place she visited in all of New England. And this is the one hemlock tree in Gifford Woods. In fact, this is the hemlock tree that makes the hemlock white pine northern hardwood region of New England. Uh, <laughs> Don't, don't, be, don't be too uh, put out by that. There were no pine trees either. So there's the one hemlock tree is actually a pretty good um, representation. But she said the boundaries of the hemlock, white pine, northern hardwood regions are ill-defined for this is a great tension zone uh, between um, encroaching more southern species and retreating more northern species. The southern species would be hardwoods coming up uh, beech, birch, and maple, and the, the northern species would be spruce and fir. Um, and it's this tension zone where the, the southern ones are moving north and encroaching upon the northern ones. And then she kind of gets confused by saying uh, it's ill-defined, but then it's a region uh, distinct of interpenetrating climaxes. That's a grand ecological theory that says that what should grow in an area depends on the climate of that area. 
And in New England, the climate produces hemlock, white pine, northern hardwood. Great theory. Uh, who, who, does, who said there was spruce here? Okay. Who said there was beech? Yeah, who said there was maple? Yeah, red maple. Well, we'll, we'll call it maple. Uh, this is a, a, a tension zone where all of those species are coming together. Uh, you, no one said hemlock, did they? Oh, hemlock. But I would have said fir, personally. Yeah. I, my, I feel like there's a lot of fir, and I don't know what it was like then, though. But. Yeah, well, that's one of the things. What's there today is a good indication of what was there in the past. Not perfect, but a good indication. So we have, we have a grand theory here that this should be hemlock, white pine, northern hardwood, or what they call the northern hardwood forest. And that, um, in the 1950s, the Society of American Foresters put together a synthetic vegetation map. This is a map of the vegetation zones. Um, and they used evidence from remnants. These are, these are leftover places that haven't been cut. This is the Cape Research Natural Area, not Cape Cod. I love to say I, I work in the Cape, but I work in the Cape Research Natural Area in Vermont. Um, we can have anecdotal data. Uh, a lot like uh, the Ira Allen. Uh, this is from Norbury, New York. Everyone, anyone ever heard of Norbury, New York? No. <laughs> you live in Norbury, New York. Sorry. Um, uh, this is part, part of a large New York grant that covers present day Woodbury. <laughs> okay. Uh, part of it that was in Cabot was described as choice land. Timbered with maple, beech, bass, some elm, ash, and birch, and in some patches, a few butternuts with maidenhair. 1773. We actually have a surveyor which, who's a famous, uh, a really famous uh, surveyor um, uh, named Samuel Gale. Uh, we'll hear a little more about them later. You can also have current vegetation. This is on Mount Escutney. And you see the northern forest, which is spruce and fir, kind of, kind of what grows up north. And the southern forest, which is oaks down here. And see, right between them is the tension zone. And here it's rather, rather um, uh, narrow uh, of the boundary, the tension of the southern species and the northern species and the mixing right there of, of northern hardwoods. And the map shows the same thing with, with a mixture of spruce and, and hardwoods in the green, uh, in the red uh, northern hardwoods, or hemlock white pine northern hardwoods, and woodberry right about in there. And then further on south, a little more transition with hemlock and white pine, and then oaks uh, down below. So we have a very good idea of what the zones should be. Good prediction, in theory. Uh, OK, there's potential natural vegetation. This just to give you a view of it. Uh, over on the right are the good um, um, uh, spruce uh, hardwoods. And the center here, which is what we have in this case, Lord's Hill in, in Marshfield, but might be a good prediction of what's around here, uh, uh, beech, birch, maple, and then down in southern New England, uh, oaks uh, mixed with some hickories and chestnut there. Um, I work or have worked at Hubbard Brook, which is a, uh, a highbrow research site uh, that's looking at um, uh, the northern hardwood forest and what it, how it functions. Um, and we have three models, uh, three different ideas of this forest that uh, have to um, occur, we think, at the same time. One of which is the current forest, right here. All right. The other is a book written about it, which is about succession after a clear cut and what would come back if you cut the forest down, what would come back, which they've done at Hubbard Brook. They've, they've run the experiment to see what's happening. So we have the present day forest that hasn't been cut, a book about what has, has gone, and this is the Holy Grail. That is a lotting map, a lotting map from 1794 of the surveying of the town of Peeling into 120 acre lots. And at the corner of each lot, there's a name, maple, birch, you got fir, spruce. This is an actual ecological survey of the town of Peeling in 1794, saying what's actually there. 
And if you look very closely, Woodstock in 1794 was 38% spruce, 32% beech, 22% um, uh, birch, and today, or reasonably like today, it's only 1% spruce and 50% maple. This is the, the icon of beech birch maple forest. Here's the beech birch maple forest, which is 50% maple, 21 or 30% um, of beech and birch, but originally it had no maple in it and was dominated by spruce. So that's the historic view, the current forest, and the book are three different stories of the same place. Which one do you believe? Well, there's a good reason for this in that the, this forest has had disturbances in it. It's had natural disturbances. That's a, a, a big blowdown. Uh, it, has anyone ever heard of Climax Forest? I mentioned it earlier with E. Lucy Brown. It's what develops uh, when there aren't disturbances. Actually, that's a moot point. There are always disturbances. Some are natural. Some are man-made. This is the, the growth of different trees with time at Hubbard Brook. You notice about uh, in the early 1900s, there's a massive amount of growth uh, spurt in the trees. It was cut over, and then it recovered from being cut over. And then in 1938, it was blown down uh, in a hurricane. So they have a human disturbance, a natural disturbance, and what you see today is the legacy of what those disturbances are. In other words, it's that specific history, much of which is human or European human, which doesn't tell you anything about the forest originally, but it tells you what, uh, that it was changed. It was changed by human, by settlement, and that's why having the pre-settlement forest, if you can, is a, a good baseline for what could be definitely a baseline for what was. All right, um, jumping a little bit to some hardcore data, uh, Susan should recognize this. Um, this is, this is um, what uh, Jesse Ford was crazed. Um, the, the person that did this uh, called it, uh, called it uh, the Waits River Sample. And everyone in the scientific community was very confused that it was from Waits River, Vermont, which is down at in Topsom or, or, or Corinth. Um, the, the thing is, it's on the Waits River Formation, and actually it's, it's South King Pond. But South King Pond, if I'm not mistaken, is partially made up because the King Farm. I like to think of this as the Sawyer Pond, um, okay? <laughs> It's on Susan's property in, the, in the, the 80s. It was cored, that is, the sediments out of the bottom of the pond were taken in a long um, core. That was analyzed for pollen, and it goes back 10,000 years, okay? And uh, they uh, got the uh, individual species of pollen and the abundance of that pollen, starting here at the, at the bottom of the lake and going down into the sediments, which is going back into time. And the two or three to look at are, first of all, uh, Fagus here, which is beech, which beech arrived in, um, in Woodbury uh, about, um, uh, who knows, 8,000 years ago, maybe 8,500 years ago got very abundant, and then for the past 2,000 years has been decreasing. It was very abundant back uh, 4,000 years ago. Here's hemlock, which was arrived a little bit earlier, um, about 9,000 years, six, seven, eight, 8,000 years ago, became very abundant, and then as is typical everywhere in Eastern North America, about 5,200 years ago, it it declined precipitously, almost disappeared. Hemlock almost disappeared from our landscape, which should say something about uh, the problems that people might, uh, might have heard about, about a hemlock, a woolly adelgid coming in and wiping out the hemlocks. The hemlocks have been wiped out once before in the history of the landscape, but then has recovered and then declined maybe slightly through time. And here, I love, this is spruce, came in about 2,000 years ago, climbed up 
and then slowly declined over the past. Spruce, if you have it here, is not a leftover from that boreal forest that came through after the glaciers left. It's a different species of spruce. In this case, the most recent is red spruce. And it probably came from the, the, off the coast, on the coastal plain, off of Maine, and only arrived here 2,000 years ago. You, you might have heard of spruce decline, the problem with acid rain or other climate factors causing decline of spruce. Actually, spruce is a, a Johnny-come-lately and is only um, um, uh, barely tolerant of the conditions um, uh, uh, present day. So losing it or having it decline is not um, uh, terribly uh, surprising. The takeaway here is that species change through time over thousands of years or over a period of, let's say, several hours during uh, a disturbance. Um, there are constant dynamics going on of species becoming more abundant or less abundant depending on the conditions uh, around. Also, just a quick look here. This is a, an aerial um, uh, image. Uh, the very dark magenta there is uh, high elevation spruce uh, and fir. And uh, the more tan colors, there's a lot of, of, of um, uh, uh, settlement and development here, but you can see uh, this hemlock white pine northern hardwood kind of mosaic of a, uh, a little bit of red, a little bit of tan kind of mixed in together. Um, this is the Worcester Range and this is Woodbury Mountain. Woodbury Mountain looks tan, doesn't it? There isn't, there's spruce on, uh, is there spruce on Woodbury Mountain? A lot? Yeah. Fair amount, there's a little cap right on top. Okay? Oh, we'll get, uh, I don't know if I put it in this slide. Yes? Before you go on, could you yeah. translate some of the tree names? On the oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, these are herbs. Um, yeah. And all this says is that settlement started here about uh, 200 years ago, which is pretty good. Um, this is um, aspen or popple. This is spruce. This is alder. This is fir, birch. This is another popple. This is actually northern um, Populus balsamifera balm de Gilead. Um, this is oak. N notice oak. That's, I have to ask, is there any oak in, other than in a front yard, any oak in Woodbury? I haven't seen a little. A little, a little. A little where? Um, up the county road. Okay, I'll have to remember that. Remind. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing a project that's looking at where oak is today because you heard about the oak army. You heard about climate change? <laughs> and climate change, the oaks are going to be marching north. Uh, you know, just a little bit like the ants, not quite because they have to reproduce and, and go. So knowing where the oaks are historically in the future, 100 years from now, it will be very interesting whether the climate change has allowed oaks to move northward. Mm -hmm. But if you look here, oaks originally arrived here 9,000 years ago. There were oaks. And they're becoming less important through time. In fact, there's a little background. We don't know if that background is from, from a regional uh, amount of pollen or not. But, um, Oaks uh, tend to occur on south-facing knolls, rocky slopes, um, and very rarely in the uplands of central Vermont. I mean, they're individual spots, and I'm trying to write them all down so in 100 years somebody will come back, go to those places and say, hey, the oaks invaded, or the oaks haven't read the books that know that climate change is they're supposed to go north. Yeah. It's a climate change issue. Why are there like oaks in Durango, Colorado, which is at 7,000 feet? Okay. That's one, th uh, yeah, the, actually there are not many oaks in Durango, Colorado, as far as I know. Um, last time I was there, uh, yeah, there are certainly in the, um, uh, the Rocky Mountains, the center of the continent, all of those zones that I'm talking about, a spruce uh, or fir at high elevations, northern hardwoods, oaks below, all of those zones are elevated relative to what they are on the coast. Why are they elevated? Because the uh, temperature regime is very accentuated. So the summers are much warmer for the latitude. 
The winters are much colder, but that really doesn't affect what trees grow there. So since the summers are warmer, the zones tend to be higher. Good, good um, biogeography lesson. Don't, latitude isn't that important. It's the temperature that's important. Okay, no. So here's um, just an idea of, of reference stands. These are the old, known old growth stands, known, known areas of old, old trees. Here's Gifford Woods, here's Lord's Hill. Gifford Woods is down where, um, uh, in Killington, where Route 4 and Route um, uh, 100 cross. It's where E. Lucy Brown visited. This is the, the one place. This is the, the hemlock white pine northern hardwood uh, type um, there with the one, one hemlock tree. Um, you can see that it's 77% uh, sugar maple, 6% yellow birch, and this is a, 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 a kind of gibberish. It has 35 meters square per hectare. Uh, what does that mean? Well, if you're, if, if you're a forester, um, that means that it has uh, da, 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 four times that, uh, 140 feet square per acre which it means it has a lot of wood in it. Um, and it, actually, here's Gifford Woods. There's the hemlock tree. There, 2%. Um, it's a big hemlock. It's actually lost its top. And I think the hemlock white pine northern hardwood might eventually just be the, the, the northern hardwoods. Uh, here's Lord's Hill, that place in Marshfield that we saw. Uh, that is 29% um, um, yellow birch. Uh, only 14% sugar maple, 14% uh, both ash and hemlock, and it has about the same basal area. Um, again, a representation of hemlocks, white pines, and northern hardwoods, but a different mixture. And this is the Cape Research Natural Area that's very enriched. Um, enriched forests have uh, vernal herbs. Um, uh, the, in the springtime, the, uh, the, the, the um, lower, lower plants are very rich. It has, it has very um, uh, strong indicators of, of richness, that is calcium um, liking uh, plants in it. It has things like basswood and butternut uh, that grow. Anyone ever find a, an enriched stand in, in Woodbury? How about up, by, up on Mud Pond at the northern end of Woodbury Mountain? Do because that is on the hit list, excuse me, the old growth potential list in Vermont. That whole south facing slope in a bowl up by Mud Pond um, that um, has been reported, uh, it's actually 25 years ago, so it shows how long it takes to get around to see what's actually there. I've never been there. Pardon? Okay. Um, so you should visit and see what it is. And if it has, um, you don't know how to um, measure basal area, but you can measure composition. You can use the E. Lucy Brown measurement, which is the first 100 trees you run across that are reasonable size, tick off, and then find percentage of each of those species, and see what the composition is in that place. See what the understory herbs are. See if you have um, uh, things like, um, um, I'm speaking Latin now. Claytonia, Erythronium, um, uh, Spring Beauty, spring beauty uh, Trout Lily, uh, Toothwort. Um, I, I have lots of that. I live near Mud Pond. Here we go. You've got a, an enriched northern hardwood forest. Lots Does of any tons, bass? Tons of, tons of trout lilies. Tons oh, of trout lilies. fantastic. How, how about a Winooski? That's a river, right? Oh no, no, no. Winooski is the onion river. Winooski is Abenaki for wild garlic. No. The leeks. Do you have an under onion fields or leeks? No. Ramps. Ramps. Okay. Uh, take a look. Take a look. And you might have a, an enriched forest like the Cape, which is actually highly unusual, although being near the Waits River Formation and we're near uh, the major uh, geologic um, um, backbone of the Green Mountains tends to be a little bit richer, tends to be higher in calcium. It isn't like the, the, the down near Berry or Berry Granite or the, 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 the Kittredge Hills or the, the Granite Hills that tend to be fairly poor. Okay, even our icons have flaws. 
Uh, these are uh, these sites, and you can see this is at, at um, uh, Gifford Woods. This is the Agency of Transportation did, uh, did a sampling of some of the big sugar maple trees there, and they have embedded uh, spile scars. Um, we can date those. It was last uh, sugared in, in uh, 1923, right there, and goes back into the period of uh, in the 19th century. Here's Lord's Hill. Uh, and you can see it has a, a, a stone wall, stone fence on either side of it. That's to keep the old growth in, or maybe it's to keep the people out. I, uh, I don't know. Uh, it also has a lot of um, uh, uh, beach bark disease and the beaches going down uh, um, there. Uh, this is uh, the, the Cape Research Natural Area. It's the only uh, national forest RNA in Vermont. And here's halfway up in the forest, and you see a piece of barbed wire. Uh, it was an old, old woods pasture, uh, uh, a land use that just isn't um, common here. Here's our one big um, landscape piece in, in New England called the Bowl, Research Natural Area in the White Mountains. Uh, and it was hit by the hurricane of 38. It was hit by the hurricane of 1815. It was hit by landslides and fires soon after 1815. 1816 was the year with no summer. Um, and all sorts of, of dynamics were going on in the past history of, of this stand, even though it has never been cut, even though the trail to it is the Dicey Mill Trail. And that, to me, is a double pun. Uh, it's a mill trail going into an old growth stand, and it's pretty dicey. So. Uh, we do have other old growth forests. Um, this is on top of Camel's Hump. Um, uh, this is a high elevation forest, uh, not terribly old, a uh, fir, um, East Mountain and East Haven. Anyone ever been up to the uh, radar site? Yeah, that's neat. Uh, uh, kind of uh, within a stone's throw of the radar site, there's the best uh, spruce fir forest in Vermont, um, um, protected by first by the Air Force and then by um, uh, being above 2,500 feet from Act 250. Um, this is Abbey Pond, which is hemlock, pure hemlock forest down in the Green Mountain National Forest in Middlebury. Here's Church Woods. Ever been to Shelburne Farms? Anybody been to Shelburne Farms? Yeah. Yeah. As you go in, don't go through the gate, um, but just go to the left of that little piece of forest along the road is, is Church Woods, the best um, Champlain Valley um, uh, clay plain forest in the whole state is right there. And then finally, on the Fragile Areas Registry is Cambridge Pines. Uh, on the, uh, if you go uh, not across the wrong way bridge, but go the right way off the wrong way bridge uh, on the north in Cambridge, you'll come to this nice uh, white pine stand at the edge of the cemetery. It used to be a potato field, but now has big white pines that were impressive enough to people to think it was old growth. All right, I'm um, going to quickly go over here. This is just Lord's Hill. I've been following Lord's Hill for 40 years. Um, uh, 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 tags were put on each tree, and we've just been following uh, how much um, a mortality occurs, and it's 0.7% uh, per year of the trees die. <coughs> and if you're really good at mathematics, you take the reciprocal of 0.7% per year, and you get the number of years for them all to die, which is 143, which doesn't, isn't terribly old, but it means that at that rate of disturbance, uh, in 140 years, all the trees are the equivalent of the number of trees that are standing today <coughs> that are full canopy trees will have died. Uh, they are dynamic. Okay, my third line of evidence is archival. Um, uh, in the archives, uh, this is Eva Morse from Callis. Um, uh, guarding uh, the piece of vellum with the, the, uh, the, the callus um, uh, lotting survey. This is her, her vault, uh, actually where she keeps her, her, her um, map or kept her map. I'm trying to get the, the callus um, select board to, to put this, which is absolutely unique, a vellum uh, original uh, lotting map of, of the town, uh, frame it and, and put it in some safe place other than the filing cabinet. Um, the, this is the real vault in Montpelier. These are records. And with these records, um, which 
I can go back to the individual towns. This looks, these are, 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 are really um, Lister's maps of the lots, the original lots in town. And if you read the records, at the corner of each lot, you can put down what the species of tree was that marked that lot. So we have a good, uh, this is the, the, the map that Eva was, was looking at. Um, this is Callus, and this is my extraction of the narrative record onto a map of the town. And this is a, really a search for what uh, are called witness trees. These are trees that are at the corners of lots. You can tell witness trees because they have signs on them saying witness tree. Um, <laughs> This is a beech tree at the northwest corner of the Kennebec Purchase in Maine, uh, which was surveyed by Ephraim Ballard. Anyone ever heard of Ephraim Ballard? No. Have you heard of his wife, Martha Ballard? Yes. Yeah. The Midwife's Tale. Anyone ever read The Midwife's Tale? That, uh, Ephraim was, was Martha's husband. And if you read um, um, The Midwife's Tale, you hear about this, this kooky guy that kept on going off to work in the woods. This is what he was doing. He was finding the corner of the Kennebec Purchase, uh, starting at a marked beech tree. This is the corner of the Kennebec Purchase today. Uh, this is a beech tree. It is marked, but it isn't the same. It's the son of the beech tree that was marked. Um, you can see here how they blaze it, and the blaze is uh, uh, over, and they can paint it. This is a post that's put at the corner of towns, and you can see here a, a blaze tree. This tree, and that tree, and that tree are witness trees. They witness the corner. The corner is established by the surveyor on the ground, and then they, they uh, uh, tie it into a living tree with a blaze, and then record it in a book. This is the only colonial witness tree in New England that I know about, uh, right there. It was, uh, I found it in the courthouse in Bangor, Maine, because there was a timber trespass case that was an argument over whether the property was on one side of the town line or the other. And a surveyor went up there in 1880 and cut the blaze out of the tree to prove where it was. It went into court. It's part of evidence in court, so it has to be preserved forever with the court records. So that's the only colonial blaze I've ever, it, it still exists in a glass case in Bangor. Um, and here I am in Callis looking at the, uh, uh, the vellum map. So you can um, get corner trees and I've been, oh, um, was there any sugar maple in, in Woodbury originally? Do you think there's any sugar maple here? No, there isn't a sugar maple tree. How many native Vermonters have we? Oh, well, that's probably why. Um, this is, if you go through these records, you can look at what names they use for trees. And here are names they use for what we to, uh, call today sugar maple, which is the orange. Hard maple is a term that is in the green, which is a Vermont term. So you call it, you should call it hard maple if you're, if you're a Vermonter. <laughs> if you're a Pennsylvania or New Yorker, you can call it a sugar maple. Okay, if you're from Maine or New Hampshire, you can call it rock maple, okay, which is their difference. Um, there's also the opposite or the, the matching one. If you use the term hard maple, what would you call the one that, that we call today red maple? Soft. The opposite of hard is soft. So soft is green. That's in Vermont. New Yorkers are kind of confused. They call it soft maple and they, they tend to sometimes call it, call it sugar maple, but those are New Yorkers. Um, rock maple people, the opposite of rock is actually white maple. That's what my stepfather called it, Jeremy. Okay, actually there's a, there's a dividing line, I think through Vermont here, where if you're in Eastern Vermont, you tend to be rock and white. And if you're, if you're right around here, you were right on the border here, so, so you could call it hard and soft or, or, or rock and white. Um, I also interview old, what, yeah? Wasn't this New York once, too? Yes, it was New York. <laughs> absolutely. Oh, yeah, not sort of. So. No. It was absolutely part of New York. Um, 
So I've, I've, I've gone around, uh, it, th this is downplaying it a little bit. I've been all over New England and over, I've, I've recently expanded. Now I've gone all the way from Minnesota to Maine, uh, accumulating witness trees. And now I have a database of over a million uh, witness trees by location. Remember, it's a property boundary. So I can tell you exactly the spot that that tree was. So you can, you can work with what its elevation is or what state it's in, all that kind of stuff. But this is a um, by species and it's coded there. The green is, is um, our, our northern conifers. The reds are northern hardwoods. The blues are temperate conifers. And the yellows and orange are um, what are called sprout hardwoods. Um, uh, um, oaks, hickories, and, and chestnuts. And if you look at the squinty-eyed view, kind of, kind of blended in here, goes from green through red, a little bit boundary of blue, down to yellow. In other words, we see those zones, but we see them on a very fine scale uh, as we look through there. Was there any question about how they picked the witness tree? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, there's no question in my mind whatsoever. Their purpose was to get to a corner that was surveyed without respect to what the witness tree was, or what the position was. In other words, they arrived at a spot, they put up a post. Then from the post, they went to the nearest witness tree to that post. And there are ways that we can look at the distances that they did measure to those trees to see if they were biased. They also measured the angles and the diameters and, and other things. But there can be no doubt that the trees were unbiased with respect to, to location and unbiased with respect to species. Wouldn't they want to try to pick a tree that would be long lasting? Yeah, but you don't go, well, the, the thing is that you have to then bypass a tree that is short lived, which means it isn't the nearest tree. Okay, um, I, can, I can argue in a lot, uh, some of it's, uh, it's arm waving, and I've been waving my arms for about three years now, trying to get a, a scientific paper that, that, gets those, uh, that gets that down to a, a numerical proof. But in, in general, uh, of those a million trees, uh, some were probably biased, maybe three or four, and, 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 and that doesn't change the numbers. Uh, I don't want to be too flippant, but uh, and it's a very good question. And the next question is, well, why they probably use beech trees because they're easy to blaze. <laughs> I won't go through that. Um, this is this is uh, Ira Allen's um, a history of, of the state of Vermont. Uh, Ira Allen um, comes to haunt us again. Um, this is his autobiography. And in the summer of 1773, Ira Allen, with three men, went from the block fort on the Onion River in pursuit of Mr. S. Gale. Remember S. Gale? Yeah. Right. All right. Who, with a number of men, were surveying in the district of New Hampshire. He, uh, Gale was a New York surveyor, even though he lived in Brattleboro. Um, uh, Allen and his party traversed the district from east to west through Kingsland and liked obtaining the surveyor's destination. They procured provisions and some spirits. I think we know what's going on. And he went in quest of him and they discovered his line. And by that, so they found his survey line. They followed him to near the northeast corner of the present town of Montpelier, spelled in the French way. Uh, here it ended. And he could not be traced further because being appraised of his danger, he made a corner on dry land and thus precipitately escaped. And Allen came to the corner an hour after he fled. On the 16th day, they reached the block fort whence they sat out. Well, very good story. Here is Samuel Gale's diary of the survey for the 16th of September, 1773. It shows absolutely no awareness whatsoever that anyone was chasing him. <laughs> one of his team, uh, one of his uh, crew was injured. Uh, he, he cut his uh, leg with an ax. He had to go into Montpelier for help. Um, um, uh, Allen is exaggerating and Gale is surveying. But we do have the location of that, which is on the county road in East Montpelier. We can go there and find out where Ira Allen claimed he, um, uh, Samuel Gale just left. Um, and uh, he was in hot pursuit. And then 
Samuel Gale actually was at that point of the corner of Truro. He went up and continued to survey up here to Norbury. Here is the outline of Norbury, New York, which Samuel Gale was surveying in 1773. Here is the town. I can't read that. What is it? Woodbury. Oh, yeah. There's Woodbury. And if you pay attention, look at the northeast corner of Norbury is just on the other side um, of um, Nichols. Nichols Cliff, actually, on the back side on the Cabot line. Okay? Um, and this is on the southern end. Um, here's uh, on the uh, 15th of, of September, here's uh, um, uh, Gale surveying. Uh, he came across a pond and then he went thence out of the pond onto a neck of land um, coming from the right with a contra dance and, and a dance hall. Then to the pond again, six change, went out of the pond, a large brook runs the south end, then over a middling good maple and beech land. Anybody recognize number 10 pond? Yeah. The contra dance was the giveaway. Okay, these are Samuel Gale's field notes from his survey of Norbury, which today we call Woodbury. Here are our field notes. These are the notes that Gale recorded as he did the outlines of Norbury. And you can see uh, timbered with beech, maple, birch, and hemlock. Who said beech? Maple? Birch? We had hemlock over here. We're getting pretty good. We're not getting uh, uh, qualitative, or we're very qualitative here, not quantitative. But, and if you want, uh, this is a place, in fact, uh, the Conservation Commission might visit some of these, these locations. Here is a uh, small s uh, swamp with a red ash, hackam attack, and cedar. What did he mean by hackam attack? Yeah, what do you mean by hackam attack? Most pe a hard hack would be a translation, but it wouldn't be ironwood. Hackam attack means one of two things in the old vernacular. It either means tamarack, which was the native name. Hackam attack was the native name for tamarack, or it could mean spruce, which means any conifer um, uh, through the native. A larch, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Abenaki for larch is hackam attack. Tamarack grows in wetter ground than the yep. other one. And, and red ash grows. You know what red ash is. It isn't white ash. <laughs> it's red ash. <laughs> it's black ash or brown ash. <laughs> okay. We don't have green ash up here. <laughs> so, um, and cedar. So this is, if there's a little swamp on the opposite of, of Nichols uh, Ledge Hill, down on the Cabot line, is there a swamp in there? That's the swamp. Oh, actually, Coit Swamp is down here. We'll run across that in a minute. Okay, so this, uh, you, you might want to look over this at some point, uh, figure out what's going on. Here's a small, see this small Hackam Attack Hill? This tells me that Hackam Attack was probably spruce because you have a small hill. And, uh, okay, that was 1773. We can jump to 1786. In 1786, the state of Vermont, the surveyor general, surveyed the outlines of all the towns. And this is the outline in 1786 of the outlines of Woodbury. Every mile on the, on the outside of the lines, they marked a witness tree. So here we have birch, beech, hard maple, hazel. Hazel? Witch hazel? And then there's no witch hazel around here, is there? No. You can get the European named hazel, Carpinus. But we're probably not, not Carpinus because they didn't have uh, uh, Australia. It's, it's one of the ironwoods in the old vernacular. Hard maple, here we have a maple at the corner, the, the, the quadruple corner there of, of, of Cabot Hardwick there. Going up here, we have a hemlock on this corner, we have birch, hard maple. How many people said maple? 
We had maple. We have hemlock uh, there. Not much. We have birch. We have beech. A little bit of spruce. Again, we're, uh, we're um, qualitative here. No soft maple. No soft maple, but there's hard maple and maple. <laughs> okay? So by, by uh, what do you call it? There must be some word meaning it, it, it doesn't, it looks like it's general, but it's really specific. Hard maple is hard maple. This maple is, I would say, had to be soft maple. Same person, a half an hour later, gives it a different name. We can look now at the mentions on Norbury. In 1773, it was 23% beech, 20% maple, 14% uh, hemlock, 22% birches. This is the outlines of towns in north central Vermont, uh, 1786. We put a bunch of towns together to get enough trees. Um, and um, this is the number of trees, 84. Uh, again, 20% beech, uh, a quarter of it are maples, 12% uh, uh, are hemlocks. And just to get down here, look at this. No pines, no pines. That is, they just didn't see any pines. They weren't around. Uh, we also have the towns of Callis and Elmore. Elmore has a wonderful um, uh, pre-settlement survey. Um, but again, just about the same 30 or so percent. The dominant was beach, followed by, in some towns like Elmore, which, uh, which has, has spruce, but um, maples, and birches, so we have beech, birch, maple forest. No pines, um, moderate uh, amount of hemlock. This is just uh, going in on those towns, and I, I, it might be, you might be interested in the towns that have surveys, but I like the towns that don't have surveys, which is missing data. There is Woodbury. There is Hardwick. Okay, Stannard. Standard is too small for anything, but you could combine it with Greensboro and you could have a nice, nice one up there. Um, if, if your town has a pie on it, I'll be happy to provide you with data. If your town doesn't have it, you have to provide me with the data. And that's very simple. Proprietor's records are around, they're in the town hall. If the proprietor record doesn't exist, at least the road surveys exist for the early roads that were laid out that have witness trees. Also, the property records of the first deeds in town have a description of the lots, which usually the lots were um, marked by corners with trees. So there are three different ways to get at the amount of trees in a town. And if you come up with a town with more than 50 trees in it from one of those surveys, I really want to add it to the database. Uh, we have um, uh, added a lot of these, these up. Here's, here's the distribution of beach in, in New England. And you see this, this strong uh, north, um, northeast, southwest through northern New England and the very strong representation of beach. 30 to 40 percent of its maximum uh, um, um, here in, in Vermont. Uh, oaks really never get this far north, but I like this. Is the, the, this is the pre-settlement distribution of oak percentage and the dotted line is the current distribution of oak from just road surveys and, 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 and general maps. And you can see the early surveys of oak about follow the current surveys. The past 200 years, the, the army hasn't been moving. Okay, we have the uh, same way with hickories. They about follow there. Chestnut, chestnut, um, the early surveys have chestnut well beyond the range. That just means the American Chestnut Association doesn't know what the range of chestnut was because they're using the present day range, which has a lot of transplants and, and, and trees that have died off. Uh, but the early pre-settlement is, is very good there. Um, we'll get to spruce in a second. Um, if you look very closely, not looking at the species, 
but doing a fancy dancy um, um, mathematical uh, representation, which just means you take towns composition and you line up towns that have similar compositions into the same class. It's called a cluster analysis and the clusters here in green are towns with approximately the same composition and the other colors are other towns with different uh, compositions and we get the same pattern of green through uh, reds, through blues, down, down to orange in the end. This is pre-settlement clusters. This is the current ecological classification. If you notice very closely, there's this boundary. The major boundary in New England follows the cluster boundary almost exactly. The boundary, the tension line, that, that northern moving forest of E. Lucy Brown and the northern forest, the boundary between them hasn't moved in 200 years. It's safe, despite being settled and cut down and climate change and, and all the things that have, have gone on since then. Not to say that they won't move in the future, just that they haven't moved in the past 200 years. And this um, uh, boundary line, this is uh, more uh, cluster analysis, and you can see the boundary line here in New England continues across through central New York this is the, the Genesee salient. Anybody from, from uh, Rochester um, like to talk to you about why there's so many oaks there? Uh, the Allegheny River, and this can be um, summarized here. Um, I've been part of a large project called Paleon, uh, which is uh, reconstructing the uh, forests of eastern North America for the past 2,000 years. This is a summary of the oak abundance in uh, 1800 and the blue is very little oaks, the reds are very strong oaks. The, the hologram looks really cool, but we can, we can look at 2000, we can go back to 1800, 2000, 1800, 2000, 1800. The thing I'd point out is the blue doesn't move the boundary. So there's look less the, oaks in those. Uh, there are in these open, yeah. Yeah, 1800 out here on the prairie boundaries, there was lots of oaks, and then here there are soybeans. See, okay, <laughs> and you see a little bit of that in the eastern New England, uh, southern New England. Here we have a lot of oaks, suburban Boston, uh, and then the oaks disappear because we have suburbia. But in the north, the oaks literally. The boundary of the distribution of oaks, as I was saying, we gotta we gotta be out there and watch the oaks move, if they want to move. So there's a difference between you're looking at oak abundance, but if you actually go to Rhode Island, because I yeah there yeah pretty much, the, it seems like it's one of the dominant trees in some of the areas. It's just that all the trees are less. You know yeah I mean? yeah yeah. So oak abundance, yes, but yeah. in terms of if you did percentage of oh yeah, well, trees, the denominator is trees. totally changed. Yeah. But I like to think of it as it isn't we're looking at the oaks in all of Rhode Island. We're looking oaks in the woods of Rhode Island, which is actually what the current is. This is the Forest Service, and they throw out any, any forest that's too thin, so you go to the... I'm, I'm really hard-pressed to find a, um, a beach in Rhode Island or anywhere in southern New England. They just weren't there. Look it up. Oh, that's the same, that's the same. <clears throat> Okay, finally, I've been talking a lot about history, but things have changed. This is a northern Vermont. Um, these are 30 towns in northern Vermont. These are the species, and this is the percentage in 1800 of the pre-settlement, the witness trees. This is the Forest Service analysis in 1982, the percentage, and this is the ratio of the modern percentage to the pre-settlement. If the modern is a, is a lot, uh, is very high, you get a number here of about, you know, 34 times as much modern as pre-settlement for popple. 400% more for tamarack. 400% for cedar. These are the trees that are expanding with, with large amounts of, of increase. 
These are the species that have decreased. Ironwood, butternut, cherries, beech, basswood, elms, and spruces. Actually this, except for cherries, this is the, are the trees that are, were growing um, uh, more or less dominating beech and spruce in the original forest and have decreased substantially, you know, 10%, 50% of their original. These are the trees that are coming on like gangbusters, popple, cedar, pines, fir, and a little bit of oak, more or less. So we have a change. We have a change from those species that are dominant in, in the original zone and those species that were dominant in um, in currently in disturbed areas. And maple is confused because the original tree was sugar maple, oh, excuse me, hard maple in Vermont. Um, and the, uh, the current species is red maple. And that's true for all of Vermont. This is 138 towns in Vermont, the percentage uh, in, in witness trees. Here it is in 1997 with the Forest Service. And again, we have cherries, poplars, firs, red maple, um, cedars and ironwoods coming on strongly, and um, nyssa gum. Any anyone who are from Rhode Island? Mm -hmm. There's gum trees. No, no, they're not gums. Well, they're they're beetle bung, beetle bung trees, swamp wood, okay. gum trees. Yes, <laughs> not 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 those with gumballs. Those are sweet gums. This is black gum. Sorry, I'm. Gum is one of those trees where you can tell within 50 miles of where you're from what name you use for it. Okay. Um, there's, no, there's no gum trees in northern Vermont, so I don't have any idea what the northern Vermont name is. Um, a buttonwood, uh, which is sycamore. Oh, yeah, yeah. And also down in, in um, uh, Westminster, there's a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And there is a historical report in the 1800s from Craftsbury of Nyssa. It's never been seen since. Okay? I don't, I don't believe it. I, I, it will be as it may. Uh, that's, that's just a rare street. Okay, so to sum up, there are different lines of evidence. You can look at things like um, anecdotal, uh, Ira Allen type things, or iconography, uh, pictures, um, uh, you can look at pollen diagrams. You can look at, at zonal diagrams. Uh, don't worry about that. I didn't cover it. You can read the book. All right. Uh, forest dynamics in the northern hardwood forest. You can visit remnants. You can look at empirical studies and historical studies. And all together, you come up with a better idea of what the forest was like. Most um, uh, lectures on the... Um, uh, Northern Hardwood Forest start with um, uh, Longfellow's Evangeline poem. This is the forest primeval. The murmuring pines and hemlocks stand like druids of eld. It's, it's really cool. And then it's a story about long lost love and, and, and the diaspora of the French Canadians from, from Nova Scotia and going down to Louisiana and, and arriving 10 minutes late as he's headed back to Nova Scotia. And the poem ends. As it begins, this is the forest, st still stands the forest primeval, but under the shade of its branches dwells another race with other customs and language, a very fractured um, uh, metaphor, but still stands the forest primeval. We still have those species. We still have those places that are like they were originally, except they have different language and, and customs, uh, and we have to learn to read them. Thank you. Oh, God. I always run over. Why don't you uh, pull it? Yeah. 15, 20 years ago, the presentation that you gave. Yeah. You talked about R. Allen Shittlewood. Have you ever figured out what that was? Oh, God. You're, you're hitting me. No, I have not. Um, I think I know, though. I think I do, too. But... Okay. Um, by process of elimination, actually, um, um, uh, Tom Sycama used to, th Tom Sikama from Yale University, who studied the original forests in, in Chittenden County and, and on Camel's Hump, used to think it was um, Ramnus cathartica. No. It's a cathartic. But it isn't a big tree. Who would, who would be on the top of a mountain in Middlesex 
calling it ramnus cathartica. No. I wouldn't agree with that. No, no. I, I think it is probably what we would, one of the moose woods, which is, actually there are two moose woods. That was pre toilet paper and moose wood leaves and make fine substance. Oh, they make good, good toilet. In fact, I used to call that toilet paper bush to all my, my um, uh, environmental education uh, people. Uh, there's also um, mountain ash, which is not an ash at all and doesn't make good toilet paper. <laughs> but it is the one species that isn't named where that one witness tree was named. So, um, I'm still not there. I'm, I, I've got two more that, that are really uh, pegwood and beetlewood. That's beetlewood, n not like the bark beetle, but by the musical group, the Beatles. <laughs> Everyone knows that those are spelled differently. Okay, um, beetle is, is the rock group, uh, is the same as beetle bung, which is the Martha's Vineyard name for black gum. Beetle bung. So you have the bung and then you have the beetle to hit the bung with. Okay, so I know that there's a pair there. There's pegwood and beetlewood. Pegwood is what you hit the beetle, uh, what hits the bee, uh, hits the peg, and the beetlewood is what, you, you know, they go together. But I don't know what they are. And um, I've, I've heard everyone say everything from Nyssa, which is beetle bung, which isn't good for much of anything because it has, it has cross grain exactly like um, uh, elm. Elm or oak, which is what they made pegs out of to, uh, for, for um, timber framing. I'm not sure, but keep your ears open and, 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 and look in the historical record. If you ever run across a name that you don't know, drop me a line because I'm, I'm keeping track of that. Um, um, I've got a lot of them uh, figured out or at least narrowed down a bit. Shit them. Mm, it's almost there. <laughs> uh, yeah. You talked about oak not being around this area particularly. We get uh, our firewood from a guy in Plainfield, and a yeah. lot of it is oak. Yeah. And if yeah. you go to Hubbard, Hubbard Park, Oh, it's full of them. Absolutely. Um, the north, <laughs> north of, well, it makes good firewood. Yeah, Hubbard Park. Hubbard Park. Yeah, right. <laughs> Montpelier is, is trying to make a profit. Um, <laughs> the uh, the north-facing slopes of the Winooski Valley, all the way up to the Plainfield line, actually to the gorge, it, it, doesn't, it goes to about Plainfield, um, you have oaks on the south facing slopes north of the river. You also have a, a place up on Lord's Hill, has a huge oak stand on Lord's Hill, very well established. Um, um, Tom McClay, do you get your firewood from Tom McClay? Because no. he's the one that has the, um, the timber camp right near the oak forest on, <laughs> on Lord's Hill. Uh, so you'd have Lord's, that's good to have burn Lord's Hill oak. I think that's, it's one of those things. Um, so their oak is scattered. Uh, there's oak on the uh, west side of Number 10 Pond, usually up on the rocky, a little bit higher in elevation. There is this crazy oak at the bottom of uh, Willoughby Cliffs, occurring with saxifrage, um, little stone breaker, um, which is an Arctic plant. So you have a plant from the southern United States in an Arctic plant growing cheek and jowl. Um, don't believe all the zones. Uh, the, um, they're around, they're scattered, um, not right here, but um, uh, in New England, uh, gum spruce swamps. Gum is a tree from the south, spruce is a tree from the east, and they come together in swamps and are hunky-dory. So if you ever have a chance going out of the Vernon Swamp in, in Vermont, uh, Actually, you drive right through it uh, on the interstate, Interstate 91, but very few people know that they're driving through a, a, a natural area. A lot are planted. I like the oak um, right out in front in just north of Albany Village on, on Route 14. There's this wonderful, huge oak tree that keeps on shedding branches on, on, on to Route 14. Um, yes, oak was planted as a yard tree, grows very rapidly in the open sun, and so they can get to be huge, and a lot of people think these, these um, yard trees are, are native. Uh, 
they usually are not, and you couldn't tell if they were because they, it's, it's, it's hard to prove something wasn't native at the time. Although there was a big controversy up on the Lowell wind power. Um, there, there was a property boundary um, uh, dispute. And um, on the original lotting map were, were zeros, O's. And the, the um, owner of the land and Green Mountain Power claimed that those were oak trees. And it came to a, a court case of whether there were oak trees on uh, Lowell Mountain. And it was amazing. It was the one time that pre-settlement forest survey researcher had a chance to testify in court <laughs> about what was going on. And I said, without a doubt, there were no oak trees anywhere near there, let alone 20 oak trees. The zeros were indeed zeros. They were the rocky places that didn't have oaks. Well, Raspberry Common is just across from Lowell, the mountain. Yeah. And those houses up there on the common yep. are well over 150 years. Yep. Or whenever the land was settled there, and a lot of those houses were built out of the trees they fell, which are oak. Mm -hmm. Could, could be crafts very common. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. They, the, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, uh, houses that were built originally, they weren't log cabins, by the way. Uh, they were frame houses. Um, were built usually out of what framing timber was, was local. And one of the ways to find the local distribution is to go into the old houses, look at the sill, or actually it isn't the sills, it's the joists in the beams in the house and see what they are. Uh, I'd, I'd love to know which house you're talking about. There's more than one, okay. as I had read. Okay, yep. Mm -hmm. And over in Cabot, there's a farm over there. It was on a fence line, yeah. but it was way back. Mm -hmm. And some of those oaks are putting there yeah 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 there, there is there is oak around yeah. there there is oak around um, but it isn't common and if I had to predict I'd say where it was it still is so uh, look for a woodlot that has oak in it yep so it's not, not really a question I just no uh, it's really exciting to see over the past say 10 years the uh, uh, increase use of citizen science initiatives and I'm just thinking how yeah. great it's going to be if something like iNaturalist is still around in a thousand years <laughs> has this record of not just you know, people saying they saw these but pictures. iNaturalist is collecting tree distributions right now and collecting oak distributions and I've been working with uh, uh, VCE Center. yeah eco studies Okay, I, yep. Um, the pollen samples, the pollen yep. samples, the core samples, uh, do you have any sense of how reliable those are in that some pollens might decompose sooner than other pollens? That's been worked out long and hard. Yeah. And the, 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 the bottom line is that pollen abundance is not equal to species abundance. But pollen, for the most part, is extremely um, long-lived um, uh, without decaying. There are some pollens that, 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 that can have some uh, degradation. You've got to remember, most of this pollen is sitting down in an anaerobic, a non-oxygen environment. And a, the way that they process pollen is they put it through a a hydrofluoric acid bath to take away all the um, mineral matter. And if it can survive a, a hydrofluoric bath, it can survive almost anything. I know your fingers can't. Oh, you, you can't put it in a glass jar. You pour it in a glass jar and the bottom falls out because it dissolves uh, silicon dioxide, um, which is no, sand. That that's, it gets rid of the sand. <laughs> so they put it in beeswax containers. Actually, it's kind of neat. The bees can, can um, tolerate hydrofluoric acid. A uh, little tidbit. <laughs> uh, well, I've, I've seen it. It's regular plastic. Well. Yeah, they put a plastic bag. Actually, you put a baggie. Put a baggie in, 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 a, in a beaker, and then you pour it in. Plastic, 
Yeah. I have worked with HF. Yeah, yeah, and you do it under a hood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Oh. And I, I am serious. Uh, going to spots on those maps to see what's there today is wonderful. Citizen science or town science or, or conservation commission. Um, also, going into your town hall. Actually, I have, a, have had a problem with Woodbury in that you're only open through noon at the town hall. One, excuse me. Uh, so I need, I need, I need all day there. I have to make two trips. Uh, and I used to teach up at Sterling, and I was always driving by without enough time to stop in. Somebody can go in and look at the early deeds, look at the the road records, and if there are any proprietors' records left. Actually, the the Mormons came through in the 1950s and um, microfilmed most of the town records in the world. Very literally, uh, because they're interested in vital records. In Vermont, all of those microfilms are in one place in Middlesex, where you can look at them. A Woodbury does not have any proprietor's records in Middlesex, but you could have avoided the Mormons, you know, when they came through, or you could have redone your town hall, or whatever. Um, there's an opportunity there, and I encourage anybody to do it, and I'd be happy to help them.